we need to make sure that we're always listening to our customer because without a customer, we don't have a product to sell. Um, I, I firmly believe that if we will work on the things that we can agree to work on, we will make overall improvement and just leave the things that we don't agree on potentially in the parking lot. Those, you know, that 80 to 85% or whatever it is that we agree on, we can make tremendous improvement together. So I think we've got to just work on making sure we meet consumers and our customers where they are and being able to help them along their sustainability journey as well, because their sustainability journey is our sustainability journey. Swallow it. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Jamie Burr, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer for National Pork Board. Jamie, how are you today? I'm great, Dr. Greiner. How are you? I'm doing very well. Well, we're certainly glad to have you on today for our podcast. And before we get started with the topic at hand, I'd like for you to maybe take a few moments and just Talk a little bit more about your background for our audience who may not be familiar with you. Sure. So, you know, I've spent my entire life in the, in the pork industry. My uh, great uncle and grandfather and uncle owned a feeder pig sale barn in southern Missouri from the 50s through the, the turn of the century. Um, and then um, I had we, we had hogs as well, ourselves at the farm, and then Went to college and uh, immediately started after grad school working for Tyson Foods in the live swine division. Um, spent 24 years there in various environmental and sustainability roles. And then through that time also, I had the opportunity to work with different committees within the port board, mainly environmental and sustainability committees. So been been plugged in the port board a long time and just feel incredibly honored to be asked to um, lead in this space for producers. Well, I'm excited to talk to you today about sustainability, and it, it certainly is, as you mentioned, you're an expert in this field. You've been doing it for a long time. And one of the things I really want to start with is how do you define sustainability? I think uh, there's a lot of different definitions floating out around sustainability. So from your perspective, as we're talking today, what does sustainability mean to you? You know, I think that's, you know, a really great question because the well, first thing I want to point out is sustainability means different things to different people. And we have to keep that in mind. Um, so sustainability means to me um, is is a continuous improvement journey. Um, and it is a journey. It's not a destination. It is just getting up every day, just as poor producers have done through the results that you can see and improve in, in, in ways that are, are better for pigs, people on the planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you bring up a very good point because I think sometimes we we hear the word sustainability today and it's it's focused on environmental sustainability, but certainly in the the markets that we're in in the United States today, sustainability could also mean producer sustainability and livelihood sustainability. And so uh, I think that's a, a really good point um, to bring home is that it's sustainability is different for everybody at different times, different discussions. Well, when we think about the pork board, um, they're obviously heavily invested in, in sustainability. And one of the questions that comes up is what tools or what options are available to a producer today if they're wanting to explore different ways of, of improving their sustainability. Yes. So, um, you know, I think it's important first to start with the journey that the pork producers have already been on. Um, and if you, if you look at just results from a life cycle analysis perspective and, and look back over the, you know, the past five decades where producers have, have been able to reduce the amount of land that, that's associated with pork production by, you know, 76%, the amount of water by 25%, the amount of energy by 7%, and then carbon by almost 8%. So I think we would be remiss to not start with, with that fact. Today, as far as tools are concerned, you know, every day pork producers get up to improve feed efficiency from my perspective. And that's the two things about that one. It's the number one cost. So, and it's also uh, the number one opportunity as it relates to how we improve sustainability in all four of those areas that I just mentioned, land, water, air, 
in carbon. So um, that's that's one tool. The other tool is I would say is that the port board has developed is developing a dashboard that we can begin collecting data so that we as a port board can do a more efficient job with telling port producer's story instead of, you know, depending upon potentially someone else telling our story for us, we're able to tell it with with knowledge from the data that producers provide for us. So that's uh, been something that's really just been started in the past year. I'm, I'm glad to say we have just over a million pigs in that um, database today. So um, that's that's one of the tools in, uh, as a for example. So as you're talking about data collection, um, if there's producers that are not involved in that today, is there a way that they can get involved? Absolutely. And the very first place they can go to is the Port Board's website. And there's there's a link there. They can enter their name and number and then the process starts from there. Um, um, another tool, um, you know, as I think about that process is the Port Board has been working with sustainability, sustainable environmental consultants on producers' behalf. And we've been paying for producers access to a consultant to begin collecting form data and then providing reports that show um, their individual um, footprint, if you will. And it has several different pieces of information from, you know, how manure has benefited their operation um, in terms of reduced fertilizer use, in terms of um, improved uh, soil health or, or emissions. Um, so that's another example. You had mentioned a, a phrase and some of our listeners may not be familiar with it. Um, you mentioned the phrase life cycle assessment. Could you maybe explain a little bit more about what that is? Absolutely. So if you think about it from the farm gig to fork and all of the emissions that could be associated with, um, the the production of fertilizer through the production of corn, including the fuel use associated with producing that crop through getting it to the feed mill and then making feed and then um, it, it, it being fed to hogs and then all the way through to the fork, it is a, a, an accounting of those emissions associated with that entire supply chain. And then we, we can express it or we have chose to express it um, in terms of pounds of pork as our denominator to be able to tell consumers the producer story. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and Pork Board is continuing to work on those life cycle assessments and, and fine-tuning those, I know, and, and certainly including the value of manure and the ability to reuse some of our resources, and in particular carbon and nitrogen. Um, and so... I would encourage producers to continue to follow along with what the pork board is doing in that space. But as you're talking about the utilization of nutrients, you know, what are consumers and, and customers needing out of, out of this discussion? I think they need to understand how it's used and how it displaces commercial fertilizer. And it's really closing a loop. You know, it is, it is a, is a full loop as it relates to, you know, taking, fertilizer to produce corn, feed it to an animal, and then reusing that manure as a fertilizer in a, in a continuous circle. And just all the positive attributes associated with using manure um, to not only save the producer money, but to improve soil health, to um, in, improve profitability. I mean, we, we need farmers. There's less than 2% of us producing food. And the more that we can do to ensure farmers stay on the field, the better our abundant food supply will be. Mm -hmm. Well, we know in, in Europe today, we're starting to see more requirements around carbon footprinting in particular and, and documentation of that. Are we starting to see that in the U.S. yet from some of our customers? We are, um, and, and I think that we should always keep an eye on, on Europe and, and know that, you know, that's potentially um, a target that we may have to meet at some point in time. Um, so we need to get ahead of that story too, from my perspective, so that we do not have to deal with all of those that our European farmers have to, have to face. So 
Yeah, I, I think you've already seen it from a CPG perspective that that consumers are demanding that goals be developed. And the thing about it that is, is with all the work that the Port Board's already been in, been in developing, is we're set up really nicely to begin as, and from my perspective, is one of the very first animal proteins to be able to start that and be able to to pull all of those in sustainability attributes of pork all the way through the supply chain system, and have a system that re, that provides actual primary data instead of depending upon a model, um, which is just so much more accurate and tells a story over a model. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that's that's a wonderful point. And we're certainly seeing that from from various groups, some of the values that they have generated. Um, I've certainly seen that from companies as well, that they have some life cycle assessment tools as well as the National Pork Board's um, life cycle assessment program. And so we have those those started. Um, are we hearing anything in terms of what, what values, and I know values get us a little bit caught sometimes, but consumers tend to have numbers in mind of where they might want some of those to be have we have we heard that at this point or is it no it's a bigger picture we just want to see that you're doing everything you can to reduce those those carbon emissions and so forth over time that's yeah, interesting you asked that because i was actually having a conversation about this in fact today but i think i think having the inventory if you will of what your emissions are is not as important as the action that you have so what is the action behind your inventory and having that narrative to be able to say, what are you actually doing um, helps tell that story. And I think puts, puts folks at, at ease, if you will, that, Hey, they, they've, they've got their arms around this. They're, they've got an action plan and, and they're really serious about, about meeting those, those targets. Mm-hmm. So it's like many other things I think that we, we do as pork producers, we probably are doing it. We're just not sharing that story well enough to to help people know that we are already aware of it and, and thinking about it and, and being on top of it. Would that be fair? Yeah, yeah, I think it's absolutely fair. And if you think about just, I also think of sustainability as efficiency. And if you think about some of the th- the ways that poor producers have become more efficient over time, um, the example that I give is. Um, in around the turn of the century, feed conversion was about three and a half pounds of grain to get a, a pound of gain in pork production. And today, you know, depending upon formulation, it's around 2.7. So the improvement associated with that just in, you know, 25 years is, is immense as it relates to intensity calculations of water, of land, water, I mean, uh, land and air. So, and not only does that help with the environment and it's, you know, less fertilizer has to be used, just less chemicals that have to be used. It's, it's improving the bottom line of pork producers. Now, I, I, I don't want to be tone deaf to not, to not mention how the situation today is not good for producers. Um, however, as we continue to come out of this, it's just ever increasingly important to have these programs in place because as we come out of the backside, consumers are still going to want this no matter what. So I, I would be remiss to not, you know, mention the fact that fee conversion, again, is the number one sustainability story in pork. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And certainly those numbers always stick with me too, is, is how much land and water we've, we've reduced our usage on and it tells a very, very nice story to the consumer. Um, when we think about their um, where the industry is today versus the consumer need, how close are we? How do we compare? You know, I, I have a tough time sometimes speaking on behalf of the consumer. So this is, I think this is the best way for me to answer that is that we we need to make sure that we're always listening to our customer because without a customer, we don't have a product to sell. Um, I, I firmly believe that if we will work on the things that we can agree to work on, we will make overall improvement and just leave the things that we don't agree on potentially in the parking lot. Those, you know, that 80 to 85% or whatever it is that we agree on, we can make tremendous improvement together. So I think 
we've got to just work on making sure we meet consumers and our customers where they are and being able to help them along their sustainability journey as well, because their sustainability journey is our sustainability journey. Mm -hmm. um, what if a producer is, is interested in better understanding some of their, their values, right? So their, their carbon emission values or, or even where they're at today in terms of their sustainability space, are there, places they can go? Are there tools on your website that would allow for them to start that process? There absolutely is. And there are a couple of things there I'll mention is one, they can sign up for um, a farm impact report is what we're calling it. Um, so that that is done through a partnership with sustainable environmental consultants where the port board pays for that. And it pays for basically an, an agronomist to come out and help collect data on the farm, it is it is very confidential and very private. It is so confidential and private that Dr. Greiner, if you signed up and gave your information, I do not have the ability to go in and see your information. As a port board team member or staff member, I do not have the ability to go see your data. Now you can print it off and share it with me if you want to, but I can't go into any system and see it. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, that is really the place to start. And then from there, SEC will provide what your footprint is. It includes things like, you know, what is your carbon footprint uh, on the farm? It includes how much soil loss do you have? But it also uh, it takes a next step. It, has, it provides for improvement opportunities. Um, so they can, they can give, based upon the soil type that you have, what are the different practices that you could implement to improve on um your footprint as well. So it's, and the other thing I just mentioned about that is SEC is not selling the farmer anything. So it, it is very third party related to providing this technical service to just give the producer information on where they're at, what they could do to improve, and if they want to set goals, they can do so themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a great resource for our producers. Um, especially if they're just starting this process of really wanting to be able to document and, and demonstrate to their consumers or to their community uh, where they stand today. And the other thing is, you know, if we have partnered with in three different Climate Smart Ag grants as well that will help cost share some practices to implement, what like cover crops or pumping uh, twice from your lagoon. Or even, you know, pay for part of having um, different lighting installed in the barn to save save energy. So um, we we have just signed the agreement with uh, USDA on what we call our grant, the Port Borge grant. And I, I'm happy to say that that just this week we have our first uh, producer signed up and ready to go to find out what pathway of the grants that that they want to take. So it'll be, um, you know, it's, it's a learning process, but we're excited to be able to take those grant dollars and funnel them through the port board to producers to, to add value to port producers. How does it relate to their sustainability journey? Now that is exciting that they have the ability to potentially get some grant money to make some changes on their farm. I think that that would certainly be exciting for a lot of producers. And then we are also, um, we'll put more perspective too, those, those grants are targeted for Missouri, Iowa, and Minnesota. And we're partnering with those state pork organizations and we're providing uh, resources as it relates to people or grants for them to hire someone to have boots on the ground that they can actually work directly with producers on. So we're not just sending them to um, anyone, we're sending them to someone that it's employee of the pork industry to help them navigate the process all the way from the SEC sign up through the grant process as well. So providing an additional resource to help shepherd that process. Very good. So they would need to do an SEC, SEC analysis and basically determine some opportunities and then use the grant money to make some adjustments. Is that how the process would work? That's exactly how it works. Um, and then we can also point them towards different grants as well. So it may not, it, our grant, the Port Board's grant may not be the best grant for them, but there's another, there's some other grants that we're involved with. For instance, 
um, Farmers for Soil Health, uh, which is a collaboration of beans, corn, and the pork board. And it was started with an MOU way back in 2000, I think 18, um, where we came together and said, you know, if there's there's some common good here. And if we will work together, we will um, reduce pork's footprint by working together. So we formed for Farmers for Soil Health that has a goal of taking today's uh, cover crops from 15 million acres to 30 million acres by 2030. And there's a grant associated with that. So that's that's a second grant that's available for producers as well through a partnership that we've developed with uh, our, our very needed partners, corn and soy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, I think those are exciting for our producers. And while some of those they may be familiar with, others may not be. And, and so I encourage them to reach out to National Pork Board and talk to them about options that uh, might allow them to be a little bit more sustainable and, and have some, some different values and impact on their production methods. So that's really exciting. It's an exciting time to be able to have a, a resource to help producers and funnel it through the Pork Board to help our producers kind of one-on-one. Absolutely. And that kind of leads into some of these opportunities of uh, examples of, of on-farm sustainability efforts to help them save money. Um, are there any others that we should be thinking about? You know, I think we one of the things we ought to be thinking about is just manure management and how we can continue to use it to displace commercial fertilizer um, and, and how we tell that story as well. Um, it is... It is such a great story to tell. So that, that's one. Um, some other programs we don't have in place yet that, you know, are, are coming down the line are some programs to help with different aspects of energy. So whether it be solar or whether it be anaerobic digesters or whether it be wind, those are, those are in the works, so to speak. But there are some opportunities. And the thing that I like about the, the solar and the wind, and I, and I understand there's a there's a tremendous cost of entry into that. And, you know, there, there will be some programs to help with that. But think about how if a producer could fix one of their costs today and that be energy cost, it's not, it's not a high cost, but at least they could fix one of their costs for the next 20 years and not have to worry about that cost of energy because they're producing it themselves. So just, just another example of something that's, that's kind of a neat idea to help producers going forward. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We have solar panels on our house and it, it's so nice to have, know exactly what my bill is going to be every month and to know it's going to be small. Um, so it is one that I, I do think our producers are, are very curious about, whether it's wind or solar or, or the biodigesters. Certainly here in Iowa in particular, we've had a lot of conversation about biodigesters and, and even how it compares to California dairy farmers and the success that they've been having with that. Um, so I look forward to those opportunities for our producers to potentially have some some new ways to to save some money. Absolutely. Are there any others that we should be considering? Yeah, I think you know we we should uh, really think about livability um, and how could we address some of the endemic diseases that that we deal with. Um, and and going forward, I think you will see the port board involved uh, in more of those those areas. How do we, you know, for instance, from a genetics perspective, how do we prevent the animal, for instance, from getting PERS? You know, one of the largest diseases that we have. Um, but also, you know, the Port Board has done a lot around livability. Um, and there's some tools available out there to show producers how, you know, for instance, a, a, an economic tool that shows how mortality affects their overall profitability. And if they made you know, different improvements to it. what, what is that financial impact? They know what the payback, what the payback is. There's been some other, you know, I, there's been some things in collaboration with Iowa State that we have identified that we could do different um, around identifying, for instance, you know, those sows that aren't getting up right in the morning to, to eat and trying to figure out how to manage um, her differently, how to make sure that we're individually looking at those sows' body conditioning to see how we can improve that body conditioning because we know body conditioning score has such an important impact on her lifetime um, and also through the gestation process. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And I know there's some some opportunities there for our listeners to go to the Pork Board website and look at those. And I do agree with you. I think having the economic tool available helps producers determine where to make the changes that are going to be most impactful to their business as well as to um, to the sustainability goals that they've outlined. And so whether that's with manure or livability, I think those are all very important. Um, certainly there's, I've received a lot of questions around how do we value manure and whether it's just the physical dollar or even from a life cycle assessment and renewable resource um, valuation, I think those are going to be continuing to be a conversation piece for our producers and, and uh, be great resources as those come around. Absolutely. Just manure plays such an important part of farmers. I'm, I'm going to call it the circular economy, but I mean, it, it helps, you know, just so many aspects of manure that, you know, that, that are positive to, to use from a soil health perspective again. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jamie, I see that our time is coming to an end. Are there a few key takeaways that you would like our listeners to, to have from today's conversation? Yeah, I think it's important. I, I put sustainability also in terms of the rear view mirror and the windshield. And it's important, you know, the rear view mirror represents from my, um, the, the progress have, has been made. Um, and it's, it's important for us to, to remember the rear view mirror. It, you know, just as we're driving, we need to use the rear view mirror to, to see what's been behind us. But consumers and customers um, really care about the windshield. Um, and that's the biggest opportunity in front of us. It's the biggest area, right? So if you really think about the area of a, of a windshield versus the rearview mirror, that really puts it in perspective. So that wind, uh, that that windshield represents the goals and metrics that we can set and also where we can continue to make improvement to make sure that farmers have the continued right to operate, the freedom to operate so that we can continue to have a safe and abundant food supply in the United States. Efficiency um, is just such a key point, whether it be a efficiency of time, efficiency of feed, efficiency of water, that is the true sustainability of pork production is, is efficiency. And if I could, if I could replace a word of, uh, with, of sustainability, it would be efficiency. So it, that would be my desire would be how we just improve efficiency, not improve sustainability. And then also just, just want to, you know, reiterate how important it is for us to be, you know, multilingual and to be able to talk sustainability to the, to the audiences that we need to and, and hit and, and, and work with them with where they're at and try to meet them where they're at as much as we can. One of the largest lessons, aha moments that I have had in my career was once upon a time, I had a group of NGOs and a group of customers tell me that food has become a religion and no one likes their religion questioned. And that's really hit hard with me um, and made me realize that, you know, we need to make sure we're listening to our customers because it is their religion and we shouldn't be questioned. If we can inform them with how we produce food um, and, and lead them with knowledge, um, and that's, that's what we should do. <laughs> that's an interesting thought. I never had considered it that way, but it's so true, right? It's such a Food is not just food for many, it's social and it's it's an economical status and it's it's everything combined. And so it's a very good point. It's time for our famous three. Ivonic Animal Nutrition is committed to ensure food security and safety while reducing the ecological footprint of animal farming. Its products and services use evidence-based solutions that seek to promote animal welfare and reduce reliance on natural resources. All this is underpinned by long-standing industry partnerships and deep customer understanding. Ivonic's focus on efficiency, sustainable, healthy nutrition, and collaborations with livestock farming partners creates value for customers and consumers. Well, Jamie, one of the things we like to do with our speakers as we wrap up today is, is ask you a couple of questions. The first one I would ask you is, is there a resource that producers could go to uh, based on today's conversation that you would recommend? Absolutely. It, it, the, the Port Board's website um, has just 
tremendous amount of information. And I would encourage encourage you to go there. I'd also, you know, let, let you know that we are um, working to begin revamping the website um, going forward, and we're going to call it the Port Cures website. So looking forward to, to that, that change so that, that it's a, a better user experience. So I would encourage um, to go there. And we also, you know, I, I'm, if, if you have the ability to leave my email or whatever, I would happy to be happy to have a conversation. I, I enjoy talking with producers um, and just l- listening to them more than anything. Than, yeah. Very good. How about something um, that's not related to pigs? Is there a book that you're reading today that you would like to share with people? I just finished one um, that I have to tell you, one of my peers, Dr. Jerry Flint, gave to me. And the title of the book is Boys in the Boat. And Boys in the Boat is written by Daniel James Brown, and it's a story of the 1930s University of Washington rowing team. Um, and they won the night that gold medal in the 1936 Olympics. And the thing that I like about the story is if you really read into the story, how important teamwork is. And if you think about having eight rowers in a boat and how important their exact movements are together to get that boat across the finish line and the, the just integral details it takes in training to get there. I love the story of teamwork and then also one of leadership. Um, the coach um, constantly thinks about well, how do I how do I get the best out of my team? How do I've got three teams, but from a varsity perspective, what are the eight that I put in the boat that can work together the both? So it's a it's a really good story of leadership and teamwork. I, I like I really enjoyed the book. I'll have to pick that one up. I like books that are based on true events, and that sounds like a good a good one for me to read. The, the last question I asked, Jamie, is uh, if you could think of someone in your life that you have defined as successful and you don't have to name a name um, and you can define success however you want, is there someone or what is a trait that that person possessed that has allowed them to be successful? Um, I would say the ability to listen twice as much as they speak. Um, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Um, and I think listening um, is such an important um, principle to have, especially from a leadership perspective. And um, I, I think also it's pretty neat to find folks that are willing to mentor others and uh, just give advice. Um, I, 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 I've often said that I've never tried to, to emulate one person. I had someone early on in my career encourage me to take a look at everyone that, you know, might influence me and pick the two or three things about them and make, make that me instead of make that person me. So pick the two or three things that you really like about someone along your kind of um, influencers and, and make that you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great advice right there. I like that one. Well, Jamie, it's, it's been a pleasure visiting with you today, and I've, I've certainly enjoyed learning more about what the National Port Board's doing for sustainability as well as uh, some exciting options for our producers that are interested in pursuing um, improvements on their own farms, as well as improving their their own impact on their communities and their world. And uh, again, we just want to thank you. And for our listeners again, this is Jamie Burr, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Sustainability for the National Port Board. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you, Dr. Greiner, and thank you for allowing us the opportunity to tell the story of uh, producers' efficiency and their path to sustainability.